Bienvenido, Trevo, gracias por la oportunidad, la verdad estamos muy agradecidos por estar aquí ¿no? y no, para mí es un honor eh, poder hablarle de sus comienzos, de su carrera, su trascendencia no solo en la música, en el cine, pero yo quiero iniciar con un rol que tenías el de Sat, que fue en el 99 que se llama The Skateboard Kid, es una historia totalmente que no solo habla de cómo la adolescencia trata de disfrutar eh, los deportes extremos. Entonces yo quiero preguntarte sobre, en ese entonces, cómo fue la experiencia el poder este, recapitular gran parte de, de lo que sería en la historia que plama cómo sería la adultez y que ahora que estás ya pues, experimentando la vida, ¿qué recuerdas de, de la adolescencia? Uh, well, I was 18, playing 15. Uh, it was my very first audition. I hadn't auditioned for anything in uh, Hollywood before that. Um, I got that audition a couple days after I came to California. Uh, and that's a story unto itself about how I got here. But I mean, it was my first audition and I, and I was lucky enough to, to, to get hired for the job. I didn't know what I was doing. I knew I had a natural instinct about uh, how to act, you know, like I had like a natural ability. Uh, I wouldn't say that I was great. <laughs> Looking back, I'm like, there's scenes that I'm like, I sucked. <laughs> uh, but I was good for the time for what it was, uh, for what they needed at the time. Um, my approach now to a role is very different because I've, I've, I'm feeling like that I, my acting skills have improved, have improved over the years. Uh, I would say they have, um, but, uh, I'm trying to figure out what else to say. <clears throat> um, I, you know, I was a kid, I was a kid, you know, everything was new to me and, uh, it, it, it was awesome. You know, it was awesome. Everything was awesome. I didn't know, how uh, it was such a, I pictured in my head that you do a movie and there's a big Hollywood premiere and there's a red carpet, you walk down, everyone's taking pictures and then it goes to theaters. Uh, I didn't really know about movies that go straight to VHS, you know, and low budget. I didn't know anything. So I was uh, naive about that. And uh, there was no, red carpet. There was no premiere. There was no one taking pictures. Uh, I just got uh, the VHS tape in the mail or something. And that was it. And then I watched it and I was like, oh, um, you know, it's a low budget movie. <laughs> But uh, the experience was, 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 was great. And uh, the fact that I got to work, um, in a Roger Corman production, because he's like the king of low budget films. I never met him, but there's all these famous directors and actors that came out of, you know, him, you know? Uh, and I haven't worked with those guys either, like Scorsese, Ron Howard, Jack Nicholson, um, uh, Keith Carradine, whatever, tons of people got their start from him. And so I got my start from him. Uh, So that's, that, that's a nice beginning to a career. And uh, I'm looking forward to what else comes in the future. Something great comes, I can go, yeah, I'm one of those uh, actors that started with uh, Roger Corman. <laughs> Gran parte de la historia, eh, yo la comprendí, pero yo sé que más adelante no la traducción. Eh, ben, es, es increíble la forma en cómo tratas de expresar gran parte no solo de, de tu carrera, gran parte del trabajo como por ejemplo a mí me gusta mucho lo que es recapitular las primeras partes de tu, de tu cine, tanto para series de televisión para tanto películas, pero es que vi hace poco una serie que ya es clásica, que se llama Ron in the Hearts, David Rees es increíble la manera en cómo se plasma la, pues, la preparatoria la adolescencia, entonces yo quiero preguntarte sobre eh, ¿Qué es lo que algunas de estos personajes, por ejemplo, David Rees, eh, han podido ser recordados hasta el son de hoy? 
para muchas personas que quieren alguna vez es haber experimentado el sueño de David Reese, los roles en preparatorias, como allá en Estados Unidos. Man, eh, knowing that we are now in the nostalgia and we are going even, but in your earlier career, man, okay. how, what, do, how, what do you think that, or how do you want it to be remembered Uh, people or characters like David Reese in Running the Hulls, man. Well, the fact that you're even talking about that character is uh, surprising because uh, because the show was only on for 13 episodes and it was, you know, one season and it was canceled. And uh, I don't even know where people can see it anymore. I have a DVD. I have a DVDs of it. Um, Richard Spate who played Mark the Shark, the, the, the guy that was older than us and always in charge. And he's got a fantastic acting career, directing career now. Uh, we sometimes all, we've met up a few times, the whole cast, along with uh, the creator and producer, Steve Slavkin, who created it. Um, and then the actors, we do, we do get together sometimes uh, throughout the years. Uh, so what am I saying? So he, he made copies of the show for everybody. Uh, so what am I saying? There is some stuff on YouTube. So what do I think about? I mean, I think it's cool if people appreciate that character, David Reese. That was, a, you know, I think that was a year or two after the skateboard kid, or maybe it was a year, but, um, I mean, gosh, I didn't even know what I was doing. Just like the skateboard kid, you know, it was just, I mean, I don't even know what to say about that. <laughs> it was such a long time ago. You know, another job that I 100% appreciated the experience, lucky to work. And uh, it just kind of came and went really fast. También, eh, bueno, ya pasando al tema de la adolescencia, pasamos al tema de lo vampírico, men. En una historia de vampiros como Frankie, yo sí recuerdo que obviamente eras protagonista, pero lo que más me interesaba es la forma en cómo se plasmaba el tema. El tema era no tenerle miedo, sino más bien qué haríamos si algún amigo fuera vampiro. Entonces yo quiero preguntarte sobre cómo es el poder saber de que en algún momento de nuestras vidas que hay en la vida real, pues, eh, pues personas que siguen dicha, dicho gusto, dicha interpretación, cómo es de pronto esta película que hoy en día se acompleja en algunas realidades, Yes, how do you see this role? Uh, knowing that it's a different vampire movie, uh, it's not about having fear from them. Oh, um, okay. Compare it with the, the roles that, or the way that they shoot movies about vampires. You, we know that this is your series, <coughs> big role, main, main role. Uh, it's a movie that when I saw some channels, I saw it because it's, it's on IDs and, and they show it some kind of. Yeah, yeah, okay. So, well, the funny thing is that movie uh, that was directed by Luis Esteban, uh, and he also wrote, he didn't write this one, uh, but he, uh, he directed it. But, he, but the director had written a movie called Only the Strong, which was a capoeira fighting movie. And uh, I like that movie a lot with Mark Dacascos. Well, he wrote that, and then he went on to direct American Vampire. Uh, and uh, I actually saw... Luis Esteban recently did a, uh, an interview with Viking Samurai. He's a, a guy on YouTube. And I, like, caught that by accident. I'm like, hey, it's Luis. I haven't seen him forever. That movie... Uh, I mean, I'll just tell you about a little bit about it. So I had, I, had I had to audition for it five times. And... I think Luis, the director, was the only one that wanted me. And the producers wanted some, like, hunky, blonde-haired model guy. But, the, but Luis wanted me. And, and then at one point, uh, me and my best friend character, played by Danny Hitt, uh, we switched roles and then switched back. They were trying to figure it out. Eventually, I got the part. But... Uh, That movie was uh, another uh, low-budget movie. And because of that, they didn't get to shoot everything in the script. So there were certain things that 
it could have been better if they had more money to shoot more things. And there's some funny moments in that. Uh, it is it is a very goofy, <laughs> like more comedic vampire movie, like you say. Uh, it's not like a lot of vampire movies, I guess. Uh, it, it didn't go to movie theaters. It was another VHS, you know, low budget or DVD. Um, but uh, shooting it was a, was a ton of fun. Uh, I got to work with Adam West, who I grew up watching him play Batman. And that was awesome. <clears throat> and I'll tell you a story about that. So he, uh, like, looking back, I wish I had asked him more questions about Batman. Uh, but I didn't, I don't know where my head was, but you know, but he, during one of the takes, um, we were in the, the RV, like the big RV we were shooting in where he, his home was. And I was like, he had those little bottles of like dead animals and stuff. Well, after a take, uh, Luis said cut. And Adam West looked over at me and he goes, um, Trevor, you would have made a perfect Robin. Now he's talking Robin from Batman and Robin. And I'm thinking like, I was thinking two things. I was thinking, first off, that's the best compliment I could ever get from Adam West. That's awesome. It's an awesome story. It really happened. It's awesome. You know, that, that he was thinking that. And then I was thinking, wow, he's still thinking about Batman. Like he still thinks about it so many years later. And I was surprised. Like I would think maybe he didn't even want to talk about that. But it was it's still, you know, a part of him. And, and I guess I, thinking about it now doesn't surprise me because he probably has signed many autographs to people and probably, I'm guessing, went to comic-con and different things and signed things as batman i mean i'm guessing you would um that was just a, that was just really cool and i'm very glad that i got to work with them um and then also uh sydney lassing who played <coughs> um the vampire's assistant i guess sydney lassing he was the older guy who was really weird uh he's like oh oh and he, i don't know i don't know if you know who i mean you, you know who i mean right I, I forget I, I forget what character he played, but he was in you know One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, which is an amazing film, and and you know he was fantastic in that, and he did other films too, like Deep Cover with uh, Lawrence Fishburne. Um, I want to say Jeff Goldblum. Uh, that's a cool cop movie, undercover cop movie, but he was in that. Yeah, I think it was Jeff Goldblum. And uh, whatever. So it's nice to work with actors that have done, you know, better work than I've done uh, <laughs> and, and things that I grew up watching. Um, so whatever. We did the movie. Um, you know, Johnny Vanuker. Johnny Van Vanuker, I think he played uh, the vampire. I thought he was really funny. He was great. And then um, uh, Mel Torme's daughter played my girlfriend. Her first name escapes me. I apologize. I know I know it. Whatever the whole Daisy. Story, what is it? Daisy. Daisy, Daisy Torme. Daisy Torme. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um that was great. Um I don't even know if I've seen anybody else. Oh, you know, I, I hung out with Danny a few times after he played my best friend. But uh I mean we oh we shot in a house that used to belong to Elizabeth Taylor. Well. And uh, I believe it was the house where Clifton, Clifton, Cliff, Clifton Montgomery or Cliff Montgomery drove away and got into that horrible accident. I don't know if you know who that is, Cliff Montgomery. He was around. Yeah, for, for my grandmother, yes. Yeah, yeah. So whatever, that was cool. Oh, and then, um, and then uh, Dick Dale was there and he does the surf music. And I know he has the music in the opening scene of uh, Pulp Fiction. After they say, nobody moves or I'm going to execute every last one of you mother bluppers, you know? And then it goes down, 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 down. So that, that guy, Dick Dale, he's playing at the beach scene. He's the one, his band is playing up on the thing. That was pretty cool. And then Lawrence Bender came to visit 
and he produced a lot of Tarantino movies, you know? He came to visit because he was roommates with Luis Esteban, the director, years earlier. So those are kind of interesting people I got to see. I think I met him. I'm not sure. I will say this. Scott Bayo came on the set. Well, and, and I got to meet him for a second. I watched him on Happy Days. I don't even know why he was there, but he was there. Oh, I think he was friends with Johnny, the vampire. That's what it was. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that was a very, that was a fun movie to shoot. Um, and Wes le dijo, tú hubieras sido un Robin perfecto. Y obviamente el director de la película es Luis Esteban, el que hizo Only the Strong, tú sabes, la película Marda Cascos, que es I, I, ellos I, apareció por allá. Dime, tell me. I will say this. Uh, this uh, the makeup artist, uh, her name is Erin. Uh, I don't remember her last name. But interesting thing is that she did makeup, she was a makeup artist. I believe on this HBO show. Yeah, she was on this HBO show that I did called um, Confronting Brandon. It's like my brother was a drug addict, and it was like it was like an after school special they called them, and it was an HBO, and um, it was like a thirty minute story. But Erin did my makeup. She was the makeup lady on Confronting Brandon, and then years later she was the makeup lady on uh, on uh, American Vampire. And then years later, she was the makeup lady when I did Sabrina the Teenage Witch. So that was that was kind of funny. And then also, the, uh, the first assistant, the, I think it was the first assistant director. I could be wrong, but I think that's what it was. There was a guy named Tomaj who was the first AD on Running the Halls. And then when I got Sabrina, he was the first AD on Sabrina. That's just kind of funny, right? To me, it's funny. Because there's so many, it's like, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's not funny. <laughs> no, funny. no, that, that's great, man. I, 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 I'm processing, and I know that, don't worry, that I remember everything, and John will know everything. John, yeah. es que muchas personas, de hecho, la de maquillaje de ahí, fue la persona que hizo después el maquillaje para el proyecto que él hizo en HBO, y que mucha gente que incluso estuvo en Sabrina, de hecho, la misma que hacía el maquillaje de Sabrina, estuvo en esa película. O sea, fue un proyecto extraño, pues él dice que bajo presupuesto, muy gracioso, pero que extrañamente reunió mucha gente que él admiraba y que después él volvió a ver eh, esa gran parte de esa experiencia es increíble, eh, yo sé que estamos disfrutando de eso, pero también Andrés hay que hablarle sobre su, su trayectoria musical o sea, yo sí. sé que tú tienes un álbum que hay que hablarle, yo tengo el mío pero ven eh, coméntame, bueno empieza Andrés y yo luego lo mío no, era. dime, porque es la misma banda y me interesa bastante preguntarle. Men, Men no Trans Sin Plaza es uno de los álbumes más, más diferentes que yo he escuchado. Porque uh -huh. siento de que no es cuanta pena ni nada, sino es un álbum de que uno le hace recapitular nuestra vida. A mí me encanta, ojalá, no sé, si tiene la guitarra por ahí que para que cante un, pero uff, qué canción. Todas me gustan. Pero On es, para mí, una de las preferidas, preferidas del álbum. Entonces, man, es increíble. No, yeah, man, it's great to remember somehow uh, your years and your career as a musician. In fact, John listened to Transit Plaza and the song On. And we know, and, I, and, I, and, I, and I'm still recapitulating because, yeah, I remember the glass plastic, man. And I was, wait, 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 wait. Is Trevor the same guy? Because I was like, I, I was remembering your career as, a, as an actor that I didn't remember your career as a musician. So whatever you want to say about Transit Plaza, the glass plastic, go ahead, man. It's great to uh, remember sure. these, uh, these years on Al Road, man. Well, um, yeah, so I, uh, I actually put out an album before the Transit Plaza, but it was before the internet. So you could only get it if I like handed it to you. Uh, and those are good songs too, but you can't find them anywhere. Uh, wow. But 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 that was where I met the drummer uh, that I worked with for many 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 years, named uh, Keith Tenenbaum. And um, he, so we started playing out my other songs, and then from there, this guy Ralph to play bass, and I played guitar, and Keith played drums, and then Ralph, I guess, couldn't do it anymore, and we got Barry Whitaker. 
So it's Barry Whitaker, Keith Tenenbaum, and myself. And we, and I was on guitar, Barry was on bass, Keith was on drums. And we played out in LA, just played clubs. And um, at some point, um, oh, I had, I was playing out a lot when I was doing Sabrina. And uh, a lot of the crew guys would come to, come to my shows. That was always nice. And uh, Elisa came to, uh, Elisa Donovan, the, the, the redhead, you know, from Clueless and other great stuff. She came and saw me at a coffee, a coffee house that I played. And, um, and then uh, we just kept playing out. And I had a little, I had some money from Sabrina. And I go, hey, let's go pay and make an album. But when it came out, it was Trevor Lasseur Transit Plaza. But years later, I, I put the album out again as The Glass Plastics, just because we were really a band at the time. So it was Trevor Lasseur, then it was Trevor Lasseur and The Glass Plastics, and then we just called it The Glass Plastics. So we played out a lot. And then Transit Plaza was just something I put out independently. You know, there was no label attached. And we would just play out and... The song about the sun, uh, through a friend of Barry Whitaker's, um, he was friends with the music supervisor for Nip Tuck, and he and he kept giving him our stuff. And then one day he's like, "Hey, that song about the sun, which is the last song on the album, uh, he liked it, and he put it. They put it on Nip Tuck, and that was pretty cool. That's probably the most well-known song that I've that I've ever put out." But it's because of Nip Tuck, um, which is cool. Um, and so, um, yeah, what am I thinking about that? So, so yeah, so so it, it was a cool album. Robert Shanazarian Jr. He put he produced it with us, and he was tra- he was working at Sony at the time. And he was trying to help us like get Sony interested in us, but they weren't. <laughs> so we just like you know put it out independently, and that was it. And you know, the glass plastics kept playing and playing. Uh, Barry had to leave. Uh, actually, before he left, this guy, Jack Yu, came in and played guitar, electric guitar. And then Barry left and Dimitri Ferrugius came in. And then Jack was out of the band. And this guy, Chris Knoll, came and played. And we just, we made another album called Time to Exist. And then that just, you know... I was just, I just was, did, I didn't want to play anymore, a band anymore. So we kind of just stopped. And, uh, and then, and then a year or two later, uh, Keith had sent, had sent me a while ago while in the glass plastics, some synthesizer music. And I started singing to it in my car when I was driving. Cause I was bored, I guess. And, and I go, well, Hey, maybe we can do something with this. And he's like, sure. So we started recording stuff and we put out, seven releases with animal clouds just me and keith tenenbaum but he did way way more than just drumming so all the music you hear is orchestrated by him he plays it all and records it all um and then i record my vocals at my house um and uh but we write the songs together in that in this you know i give him something like a, a melody and he'd put a bunch of instruments to it or he'd send me some music that was already done and i would put a vocal melody to it in lyrics and um and so that's kind of how we'd work uh and we, we have yeah seven releases so from 2012 to 2021 we put out two full albums and five five single eps and that music is very different than the glass plastics uh they're both you know the glass plastics is more like folk rock acoustic rock and then kind of like like inspired like by music at that time, by the Killers, but I can't say we were as good as them. That was just the inspiration. And then the then the Animal Cloud is is just more, you know, synthesizer, electronic-y kind of um, pop type music and and whatever. So um, we haven't played out in a long time, and and then uh, and so that that's just what we did. We we put a lot of stuff out, me and Keith, together since 1999 to 2022. I've worked with him the longest in music than anybody, but um, that is the history of that music. And of course, uh, now I do 
Swadley and Dean, which we can talk about later, I guess. Man, if you want to talk, go ahead. In fact, crazy data. I was thinking this with on me thought, man, and re- I need to rewatch it knowing that your son is there. And what? man, it's crazy because the no, yes, yeah, because I was I was like thinking, no, man, like oh, in thinking in all in all in series that I still I watched it in those years, and I was thinking on me thought. So now that you tell me that that song is in me thought, I need to rewatch it. Well, I know man, I know the scene it was in. That's the scene. I don't know the season, but I, I know, the- know the scene. Oh, you- wait, I will. No, no, I will rewatch the series and I will find it. Don't okay. worry. Sure, sure. And man, it's crazy because you tell us something that the those albums are like lost data, no? The, that data that you don't find on the internet. So it's way to know it because you know there are, there are a lot of icebergs and things written, uh, written in the internet about those data. So the glass plastic dot albums. Maybe before uh, time, time to season that they are lost data. Wow. Well, I'll and, tell you this. I'll tell you this. Uh, I have a song called Part, uh, Carl, called 5 a.m. that was never put out. It's a piano song, and it was a glass plastic song as well. Um, and it's called 5 a.m., and it's on the DVD of Party of Five. That's an old show from a long time ago. And it's also on the DVD of uh, Felicity, but I don't know what episode. And then I also acted on Felicity. So I acted on Felicity in one episode and then had a song in one episode. That's it, though. <laughs> wow. And John, es que me está diciendo por favor que también quería hablar de, porque me resumió toda su carrera musical y hay wow, más man. proyectos incluso, muchísimos. Le preguntamos sobre otros proyectos o tienes algo más. No, preguntémosle oh, sobre otros, claro. Eh, Trans Plaza. Uh, there's a song called OK, and that was in a movie called Right at Your Door, but it was very minimal, just playing on the radio in the background. Uh, the, it was directed by Chris Gorak. It, it, did, it did pretty good at Sundance Film Festival. Um, it's a drama, uh, but yeah. And I also had a song in, uh, what else? Oh, this movie I did called Eden's Curve had a place I found in that, and that was written for that movie. But that's all that, and then uh, I did the 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 music with another guy, like the score with another guy, and I totally blanking on his name. So that's that. Okay. But you wanna tell us more about your the, your new music? In fact, no, I, 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 you, I, I, if we want it, we can do two sessions. Don't worry, man. Oh no, I, I guess I could. I mean, do you want to talk about Swadley and Dean? Yes, because you tell me that uh, we can talk about late. We can talk about it later. If you want it, go ahead, man. Don't worry. Yeah, sure. Um. So, Swadley and Dean is a, um, it's a madcap music show, small children and big kids, big kids like you and me, right? So, basically, let me try to even, we play live shows on Reddit, and um, we do that every week. So, um, Swadley and Dean, we play on, on Reddit. Swadley and Dean, yes. We play... Um, Wow, man. We play live shows on Reddit. The top. We, we do it every week. No, usually m- usually Monday. Ah. Monday. We, we play every, every, we play all the time. We have a, a, a not that, sorry. Ah, Reddit. <laughs> Come on. We play many, many shows, right? Many, many shows. Uh, but it's, it's live. So we have thousands of people that watch us. Uh, on Reddit, and we, we love doing it. Um, but usually it's 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. So it could be any day of the week. It could be multiple days. I tell people just check Reddit, 12 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, see if we're on. Uh, but we also have a YouTube channel. And uh, so, like, we have a ton of ton of videos. We've got hundreds of videos. Well, I can't really... It's hard to show on this, but... Don't worry. You can share, you can share us the link, and when this interview is uploaded, we can share the link from the channel, okay. and we'll wait to still listen to your music. John, obviamente, este proyecto, cuando la entrevista se suba, sube, por favor, el link, él te lo va a pasar del canal de YouTube. Siguen subiendo conciertos. Por supuesto. Of course, Here, man. Here's the sample, okay? Yes. 
Only because shit. So, Andrés, dígale que yo me siento en un episodio de, no sé, un episodio. No, man. Yes, uh, John said that he feels like in the episode of something, man, with the music, but he didn't kind of describe it. Yes, man, he re reminds me somehow that um, not in the same style, but yes, in the same vein of David Jazz, you know, the songs that they did from shows, that they are so unique, so quirky, but no, man, I can classi cannot classify this. I, I, I love it. The <laughs> only thing I can say is that I love it. Well, cool, man. It's, it's, uh, we have, so basically, it's me and Swindeli. That's my, that's my partner's name. And uh, he is a kid, and uh, I'm really good friends with his wife for many years, and that's how I met him. And she was like, you guys should make a kid's music show because he's a songwriter. <clears throat> he was in a band called Man Break and they had a lot of success in the 90s in the UK. And so we just, we put our heads together and we created these songs and uh, I made these puppets and we created characters and we started two years ago. And so now we have 50 songs, hundreds of, you know, over a hundred music, over a hundred videos. We've got 12 episodes And, but when it first started, it was just the puppets, it was just the puppets. But then we started playing live and people started liking us as well. So then we made a 12th episode where we're in it. And then we started, he started, he put on that spaceman costume with his Roman helmet. And then I put on a Swadley and Dean shirt, some glasses, a hat, and that, <clears throat> that became our look. And so that's what we do now. And, um, and we just, you know, we, uh, we play these shows on Reddit. And we're on TikTok, Instagram, and we have an album out on Spotify. And we've got like four more albums to put out. And we've got a website, swadleyanddean.com. Uh, I've got t-shirts, all that kind of stuff. And it's just something that I'm doing. It's, 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 it's creative. So it's basically like I'm, we, I produce the show with him. We write the, the scenes, the episodes, the music, film the videos, just us two doing everything. So I just, it's like an experience of producing and creating uh, and just, you know, creating content and, you know, seeing what happens with it. But surprisingly, we have a ton of adults that love what we do on Reddit. So most of the people watching, um, they're all adults. We've had shows with 290,000 people watching um, and then shows where it's less, but still in the thousands. So I don't know. Got to see what happens with it. But it's fun, you know? And we are two adults that we now love it, man. Wow. John, continúa. Después te cuento todo esto. De hecho, es que yo me siento en un jodido episodio bonito. No, es increíble, man. No, este... Aparte de eso, él tiene grandes, pues, realmente, películas importantes. Tú, no sé si vas a preguntar sobre La La Land. Eh, también sí. sobre, obviamente yo le pregunto sobre lo de Sabrina eh, men, antes de poder este llegar a tú ya tenías toda mente ya tu carrera consolidada y men, o sea cómo fue no solo la experiencia con Sabrina sino también el poder este que muchas personas puedan, obviamente puedan reconocer el nivel de la serie como algo increíble que de pronto la nostalgia en cómo se ve y qué opinas sobre todo este o sea todo este largo recorrido a través de esta serie qué has pensado actualmente sobre qué de pronto hubiera incentivado más tu personaje a poder tener más no sé libertad o, o poder experimentar un, un, un nuevo más conceptos Sabrina yeah, do you feel that do you need to like experiment more do like more scenes 
or you feel happy with the things that they recorded back on those days. Man, Sabrina was huge not only in in Latin America, in, in, in North America, in Latin America, also in the whole world. People still remember you about that. So tell us. I was lucky enough to do two seasons. Um, I know there were people that were on before me that did one season and that was it. And I remember my first day, the wardrobe lady said to me, um, she said, don't go, like she's basically saying, don't buy a house. Don't go spend all your money because uh, characters come and go on the show so fast. I'm like, okay. Uh, but I got two seasons, so I was, I was lucky. <clears throat> of course, I would have loved to have been there for three seasons, uh, do another you know season. But uh, they don't really tell you why, you know, you're not coming back. Uh, it, it, it's not like personal because I know we had a, a reunion party two years ago. It was just at a coffee shop, but everybody was most everybody was there. That was fun. So if it was personal, they probably wouldn't have invited me there. So, <laughs> uh, and everyone was nice. Um, but uh, sort of my saying. So do I think, I mean, I don't know. I mean, of course it would have been nice to do more. I was lucky to get two seasons. I think I, think I did everything I could have done with that character, I guess. You know, I mean, I don't know. <laughs> Cause it, it just, that's just the way it was. So it, it wasn't like, I didn't feel, I didn't feel cheated. Like, Oh, I didn't get to explore more. You know, like, I think I did, you know, what you I did. did. No, but, man, but, you, you did well. Funny. Cause I, I don't really know how, I guess I know, I knew the show was popular obviously, but I didn't know, like, like you, you said it was like popular in Colombia. Yes. Like, in Venezuela, like, Colombia. There's no way that I would ever have known that. Like, I didn't know that, you know? And uh, <clears throat> I will say when I, when it was on, when I had, when I, after the first season, I went to the United Kingdom and I was in a hotel lobby with my friend and there were these teenage German girls, like 25 of them or something. And they were with a, a woman, an older woman. And they kept looking over at me. <laughs> And then one came over and asked me in, in broken English, like, was I on a soap opera? And I said, <laughs> I said no, I, I wasn't. I go, they must think I'm somebody else. And they kept looking. And then finally they came back and said, were you on Sabrina? And I said, yeah, that's what they meant to say. But they said soap opera. And then they all came over and wanted to take pictures of me. And that was pretty interesting because I hadn't experienced that before. Um and then I was out shopping by myself and a woman came up with her kids and wanted to, actually they didn't get a picture of me because they didn't have those type of cell phones back then. I don't know what they, all I know is that it's hard to know who, who, who is aware of me because you know what also back then there was no Instagram, no TikTok, no Facebook. So if I was, if that was happening now, I'd probably have, a ton of followers on Instagram, right? Because I, because I'm currently on a show and, but, um, so I, I always thought, I mean, I guess I think, what am I thinking? I'm saying back then it was hard to know how many people were aware of me because there was no social media, you know, you know what I mean? And I so, will tell you why most in the city in Cucuta, because we are not from Bogota or Cali, the big cities from Colombia. You are popular, of course, Sabrina. Cucuta is in the border with Venezuela. And, you know, I, will, I, will, I won't talk about politics, but you know that uh, Venezuela uh, had different politics that they had now. But on those years, the, the border was open. Uh, there were like, you, in fact, you couldn't tell that this Cucuta it was Colombia or Venezuela. It got, uh, and we see the channels that they got there. There was a channel, uh, it doesn't exist now, that was called Venevision. And it's crazy because they showcase the soap operas, but they show Sabrina. And that's why the people from this city know knows a lot about Sabrina. Maybe some, some people they recorded on VHS, I don't know. But here in Cucuta, Sabrina is very known and 
Kirin Kubuta is first we are lo we are lucky because we watch it without cable, no? We watch it on 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 open in, in open television. So yeah, man, you are popular in Venezuela and in Colombia mostly on Cúcuta. Oh. And John, ¿qué tienes que decirle? Porque después te cuento por qué le conté eso, John. Well, that's cool to know. You know, any Venezuelan <laughs> Colombian filmmakers, reach out. Yes. Yes. John, ¿tienes una pregunta? I'm always interested in working with, with other people that are, you know, from other countries, but I don't always get the opportunity to, I, I guess, because I don't know. It just hasn't happened, but it, but it would be, it would be interesting to do other work in other countries, you know? Yes. No, man. And thank you for being here because this channel started as a project from the university, from John, it started growing and man, this channel, we, we don't win money. So how we? This channel got nothing to lose, so yeah. uh, we do things that are amazing, man. You you have to see the, the guests, uh, and for us, it's great to have you here, man. If I tell some people that I was going to interview um, Miles, what? Because, and, and they didn't believe me, man. Uh, you, you're kidding, man. You're, no, no, it's fine. But not only Sabrina, man. You also appear in one of my favorite movies that is La La Land. Tell us. Well, that's funny. To me, because <laughs> yeah, that's funny. <clears throat> I'll tell you why it's funny. So the funny thing about that story, man. Now, here's the thing. When you first saw La La Land, did you know I was in it before you saw it? No. At what point did you know I was in it? You had it. You had to to correct, correct those men because we loaded that in the channel. In fact, there are so many INDV data that are grown. When we read, when when people started reading INDV data, what? Is, is, it, 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 you have to tell us that it's grown, tell us. Is this grown or is it right? So wait, so you said you looked on IMDB? Yes. Were you looking at, at my credits or were you looking at, at the credits of La La Land? Uh, your credits. But when? When did you first know that I was in La La Land? When? I'm just curious. And when I saw your INDB and I saw your credits as an actor. No, but when was that? When was that? How long ago was that? That's what I want to know. No, like one week before this interview. Okay. And that's the thing, Tell right? <clears throat> so were you thinking, who the hell was he? Who was he in La La Land? I didn't see him. Did you did you ever did you ever go back and see me? No, because I remember. In fact, I have to tell you something about La La Land. That's the kind of movie that and that will happen with Sabrina because uh, for me it will be great to repeat and repeat all the episodes. La La Land is a type of movie that yes, I watch it, yes, I enjoy it, but I won't watch it again. Not because I hate it, because I love music. Oh, I get it. Uh, here's the thing. So. The thing about that is this, okay? Because there's a couple funny things for me. So I, I got a, a, an email from my agent. And they say, hey, you have an audition. Uh, it's a couple lines. You don't have to go out for it if you don't want to. And I'm like, no, I'll go out for it. Whatever. Okay. Still pays me money. It's acting, you know? <clears throat> of course, I prefer a bigger role. But whatever, you know? So... I, it was a couple lines. And so I went to the audition, the casting, and uh, I sat in the waiting room and I'm thinking, this is like one of the hardest roles to get. The smaller the role, I've always felt it's the hardest to get. Why yes. is that? Because it's so specific. It's so specific. It's like a tiny piece of a puzzle, you know? But it, it, so whatever. So like, how am I getting, it's like, because I think this, I think there's not much that I can do in the audition because I only have two lines. Two lines. So how can they really get a sense of what I can do? So I went in and uh, casting director puts me on tape. I do the audition one time. And I believe it was this. I said, um, Ryan Gosling's playing the piano, I guess. And I go, oh, it sounds good. And I go, oh, I got a check for you to sign. And he goes, okay, cool. And I go, oh, I did a pretty good job in that piano. 
That's it. That's the audition. And she goes, thanks. I go, thanks. And I go, I'm never going to hear from them again. <laughs> and then I go home. And then two weeks later, I find out they want you for, uh, for that movie. But it's going to be a different part. And I go, okay, great. And then I see when I audition for things, I don't like to look about who's directing, who are the other actors. I don't want to think about any of that stuff. I just want to focus on the part and, and the lines. Because if I think about who's directing or who's this, then I'll think about that too much. And honestly, it doesn't matter unless I get the job. So um, I looked at who's directing it and who was going to act in it. And I was like, oh my gosh, this is a big movie. What? What? <laughs> How'd this happen? And uh, the funny thing is, did you see Whiplash? Yes, of course. Okay. See, I saw Whiplash years earlier, okay? Many years earlier. And I loved it. I own that movie. I loved it. And I, I said out loud, I remember this. I said, I want to work with that director, Damien Chazelle. I want to work with that guy. What I should have said is, I want to work with that director, Damien Chazelle, in a film where I actually have lines and I speak. <laughs> okay? So I found out a couple of days before, you're playing the valet. And I'm like, okay. And they go, I think you have a scene. Oh, and then I went for my, for my wardrobe fitting, okay? And I went there and they were saying, yeah, I think you have, I think you, you're a valet with Ryan Gosling and you have, you guys talk about stuff. And I go, that's awesome. Um, and by the way, when I was getting fitted for the wardrobe, I heard Ryan practicing piano like the entire time, like in some other part of the place. And they said, oh, that's Ryan. He's practicing. I'm like, oh, that's cool. So what happened was the night before the job, they sent me the scene that I was in. And it just says, the valet is standing in front of the podium or something like that. And then the Ryan character comes and has words with Emma, Emma Stone. He bends down, gets his keys and leaves. And I go, okay, but wait a second. I didn't see any lines. Where are the lines? How come I don't have any lines? <laughs> and then I was like, interesting. I have no lines. And then I was thinking, why did they give me this role? Like they could have just gotten an extra and an extra is somebody that doesn't audition. They just look at pictures and go, have that guy do that. And then he gets hired at a lower pay rate and just, go, and then does the extra job, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. People do that, you know, but I'm thinking, why, why, why me? Why not just have, get an actual extra if I'm just, I'm basically being an extra. And I was frustrated because I was thinking, I have been acting for like, tw now it's been thir 30 years. I've been in business for like 30 years, okay? And at that time, it was like 20 something years. And this is the first time I was in a major motion picture, big production, right? And I had no, no lines, zero lines. <laughs> and I'm like, you know, I was like, wow, this is so surreal and funny and just okay you know i'm doing it i'm not going to complain but i'm just like uh you know so uh i got to set i had a little trailer you know i saw emma stone come out of her trailer to go somewhere and she said hi and i went hi and she was nice and i, mean, I didn't talk to her but that was it she's hi to me and i got to the set in this, this house in Mulholland Drive, and I saw my, my, my podium where I had to stand. And uh, Damien, the director, came up to me. He's a tall guy. Uh, and, he, and he put his arm around me, and he goes, Trevor, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate you being here. Uh, so here's where you're going to stand. Here's the podium, and blah, blah, blah. And I said, yeah, thanks. And I, just, I, 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 I didn't get to ask him, well, why did you hire me instead of an extra, and blah, blah, blah. And then there was another guy there who was also a valet. Funny enough, his name was also Trevor, but he was hired as an extra, right? I was hired as, 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 as a day player, as, a, as a, an actor who was hired for the role, who auditioned and got the part. And we both thought that was kind of funny, me and that other actor. And then, you know, we did the scene and, and basically this. So Ryan 
if you if you rewatch, it's the scene when he's leaving the party, the party where he was doing the '80s band, and when he's when she says George Michael, George Michael, and he goes, uh, what, what? And he gets the keys. I'm standing in front of the podium. That's me. It's my big break. I'm kidding. <clears throat> um, so what happened is uh, he comes out, and I didn't know what to do. I'm like, but well, what do I do? Do I just stand here? Do I let him take the key? What do I do? And I say, you know, I'm going to do something. I got to do something. And I just thought, I'm going to feel him behind me, and he wants to get the keys for this girl. I go, I'm just going to turn around and be like, I'm not going to say anything because I don't have any lines, but I just look at him like, what are you doing? Like, this is, you're, 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 you know, I'm, this is my podium and you're cutting the line. What are you doing? So I just gave him a look. I just, I gave him a look. I went like, can I help you? But I didn't, I, with my eyes, I didn't say it. And he didn't expect me to do that. And he said, take it easy, Chad. He took out a fake $5 bill. He put it on the podium, got the keys and walked away. And then he came back. And he said, hey, did you like that? Did you like what I did? And I said, well, you called me Chad? He goes, yeah. I go, yeah, I thought it was funny. He said, well, I said that to you. I said, take it easy because you look like you wanted to fucking kill me. And I said, oh, I said, uh, want me to keep doing that? And he goes, yeah, keep doing that. So that was, that was cool to have that moment. It's not in the movie at all. Um, and, you know, the funny thing is, I said, you know, what you're picking up on was the frustration of being in the industry as an actor for many years. And it's my first big, big film and I have no lines. <laughs> That's what that whole, you look like you wanted to kill me came from. It was, but I was just, uh, I didn't want to kill him, of course. I wasn't mad at him. I, was, I wasn't even mad. I was just like, I got to do something, you know? I can't just stand here. Whatever, it was fun. It was cool. It was nice to have that moment with him. Uh, I didn't have any conversation with him beyond that. I did, we didn't even introduce each other, nothing. Um, but it was very surreal. And I was there for like eight hours. Then they shot a long shot where he was, I think, in a car. And I still had to be standing at the podium. So it was all day long. And it was, it was very interesting to be on a set that big. I mean, that was a set. I was standing. I mean... You know, to my right is Emma Stone. She won an Oscar for it, you know? Behind me was the director. He won an Oscar. And then there was Ryan. He was nominated. It was like a tri it was like an Oscar triangle. <laughs> like, here's me. Here's Emma. Here's Damien. Here's uh, Ryan. And, and then here's me with no lines. She wins an Oscar. He wins an Oscar. He's nominated for it. I have no lines. <laughs> so... That's just funny. It's funny to me. And I'm and, and all I was thinking is, I feel like they're just thinking I'm an extra, which is, it's fine. It's nothing against extras. But I was like, no, I auditioned for this part. I auditioned to have no lines in this movie. <laughs> so uh, it's just a funny, it's a funny story. It's a funny experience. Uh, totally appreciate appreciate that, that, that I had that experience. And that Damien... Um, gave me that part. He didn't have to. I, I still don't know why he did. Um, I would love to work for him again and have lines next time. But uh, if that's as good as it gets with him, then that's as good as it gets. But, uh, but it was, it was, it was a whack. It's, you know, it's just a, it's a funny, it was a funny experience, funny experience. But John, here's, the other, here's the other funny thing is that on IMDb, Mine is the last name when it comes to the cast. And underneath it, it says, click to see rest of cast. So a lot of times online when it says, a lot talks about La La Land, it shows the cast of characters and my name and picture shows up. And it's just because I think it was the luck of the draw. My name was the last name before you had to hit click to see rest of cast. So it like, it appears like I'm in the film. And like, you know, my name, it comes up. It's just funny to me. Maybe it's not funny to everyone else, but it's funny to me. <laughs> because... But, but there is a... Uh, yes. John, ¿tienes alguna pregunta? O uh, finalizamos o le hago una pequeñita. Bueno, eh, coméntale tú. Para no, man, before, no, man, before we end this, do, um, 
because we don't want to, but thank you for the history, of course. There is a project that before Sabrina and after La La Land, or, or before La La Land, that you feel like, oh, yes, man, I really like that. Uh, this, no, this is that in my career or something. Ask me one more time. <laughs> there is a project, I don't know, uh, after Sabrina um, and before La Land or between, that you yeah. say, yes, man, I really like to be uh, acting in this project or I really love it. Do you want us to showcase? So was Maybe there a project the, I did? That, that you love? Uh, that between, I did between Sabrina the and La La Land or or, or Yeah, Lego. yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> let me think. Yeah, I mean... I did a very small role on Reno 911. Mm. That was fun. Uh, I play, It was called the, the, the Junior Brothers. I only had a few lines, but it was really fun to work with Tom Lennon and Ben Garant. They are hysterical guys, writers, directors. They're just great guys. Um, I, now, I haven't worked with them since. hope I will one day again. They're, 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 it, was, it was a great experience. Um, and then I did a film... Uh, called Lionhead, mm -hmm. uh, in which I was the lead, and I got to work with Michael Madsen, and that was awesome. Because uh, I asked him about Quentin Tarantino because he's done like four films of them. So now you have. So Michael Madsen was that was awesome, and uh, I mean, yeah, that was a great film because I was the lead. It was fun. Uh, I mean, it, it's a it's a quirky film, you know. It's it's, it's not. Um, I don't. I don't. I mean, it is what it is. Another low budget movie. Uh, but very grateful to do it. I think I got the job because um, they already had an actor in place and he had booked a uh, television commercial and that was going to pay him more money. So he dropped out the week before and they had to cast someone immediately. And so I auditioned, they cast me right away. I'm like, awesome. Thank you for doing the commercial. You just gave me a job. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, what else? I don't know. What else did I did? Hey, it's Trevor Lesseur, right? <laughs> Check out Swadley and Dean. Go to swadleyanddean.com. S-W-A-D-D-L-Y-A-N-D-D-E-A-N.com. Learn all about us. It's a madcap music show for small children and big kids. Big kids like all of us. Uh, and we play Reddit live. We play live on Reddit um, every week. Uh, and uh, we also have a YouTube channel and we're on Spotify. We go to swadleyanddean.com and you'll learn everything. So I just plugged Swadley and Dean. <laughs> no, man. Thank no, you so man. much for your honesty. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, it's an honor. Well, it's an honor, man. And well, Felipe, Sabrina was huge here, man. Uh, oh. How you here is Ray, man. Well, that's awesome, man. And yeah, if you ever want to do this again, just reach out. Yo, que si lo quiere hacer, no, que le diga oh, que... man, thank you, thank you, no, if primero. I, if I ever come to Colombia, I'll let you know. Yes, que es cuando venga a Colombia nos hace saber. Por supuesto, oh, man, gracias. Thank you, man, yeah, yeah. thank you, Trevor. Gracias, gracias for you. Gracias no, por esta oportunidad, God bless you, good, good project, man. No, man, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so much, man. Thank you. Bye, bye. Bye, bye, bye. Bye. bye.